<coughs> guess you notice we have a wandering front door. <laughs> the main problem is don't wander out of the old one. <laughs> This evening, we want to point out a few more or less recent findings which indicate that Western psychology is beginning to move from some of its most cherished footings and is coming rapidly into a kind of partnership with both Eastern and Western mysticism. Perhaps the one of the simplest points is a new attitude arriving concerning the problem of pressure and the effect of pressure in producing psychotic tensions and trauma. Actually, a complex or any negative psychological fixation is not of any particular importance in itself unless in some way it receives nutrition. Like everything else in the world, a fixation must feed. It must be nourished. It must be sustained in some way. And the individual who is developing a pressureful interior life is likely to begin by trying to break up fixations or attitudes which seem to be causing him trouble. It might be likened roughly to a situation of a skillful prize fighter and his advantage over an unskilled opponent. The chances are the opponent will not last long. He won't have a chance. But if you take this skilled prize fighter, lock him away somewhere and give him no food for 30 days, a much less skillful man could defeat him, simply because his energy is reduced. His strength is partly at least destroyed. In time, it could be completely destroyed. He must therefore be fed. And nearly every problem that we nurse and nurture depends upon its nutrition for its authority as a problem. Remove the nutrition, the problem becomes less and less real. So instead of attacking all of the uh, various mental attitudes separately, and attempting with rather obvious Western violence to uproot them, there are probably are simpler ways of overcoming most of the abnormalities that we suffer from mentally and emotionally. One of these ways is simply to remove the source of energy by means of which the problem is maintained. Now the source of energy in the average individual is also the same energy by which through unreasonable action he contributes to the problem. Problems arise from the misuse of energy. Situations become more difficult to the degree that we continue to devote to them unwisely energy which might have more constructive and proper channels of expression. The individual, for example, who has a quick temper or a bad disposition temperamentally, his temperamental disposition could not exist without energy. It takes a great deal of energy to have a good temper fit. It takes considerable energy to have a good crying spell. It takes quite a bit of energy to hate somebody. It takes energy to criticize people. It takes energy to be sorry for ourselves. It takes energy uh, to reject life. It takes energy to break patterns and it also takes energy to create patterns. Thus nearly everything that comes out of our complex characteristics, everything is what it is because of the energy that we bestow upon it. If therefore we are confronted with a situation 
that is not what we want it to be, one of the simplest and most direct ways of, of, of annihilating that situation is to starve it out. So simply turn from it the kind of energy by which it can survive. Uh, to reduce the available energy to support a psychosis is difficult for the reason that the person is not always able either to control himself or to know what particular type of control is most indicated in his case. Yet again, the problem remains comparatively true as we see around it in life. The dandelion and the palm tree grow out of the same earth. They derive energy according to their natures. Paracelsus pointed this out long ago. Therefore, complexes of many kinds and temperaments of many levels derive their individual expressions from common life supply. The life supply totally turned away from the individual terminates his existence utterly. And as he goes into this state of non-objective existence, his problems, as far as his personality concerned, disappear at least in their relationship to other peoples. But energy is our answer. And energy is something that the average person does not adequately control. He wastes it. We waste it every day. He dissipates it. He builds tensions within it which finally cause it to break through because he has obstructed normal patterns of life. And though he may not realize it, in most cases, his energies are greater than his abilities to use them. And this becomes a very important issue. When we say abilities, I mean manifested, immediately available abilities. Certainly energy could be used to create greater abilities in the individual, but he is not always inclined to use energy in this way. Actually, most persons are restless. Uh, they are frustrated in some way, simply because their natural energy expressions do not have adequate outlets. Now, energy flowing desperately outward will do the same thing as a flooded stream. It will break through dams. It will destroy good land. It will um, break through dikes and embankments and flood important communal areas. Energy out of control floods the mental and emotional life, resulting in excesses of numerous kinds, uh, which arise always from lack of control. So in the Eastern and the mystical way of thinking, there's an important clue to control a directed behavior. And this is energy sublimation. The supply of energy not called upon falsely. Energy is a kind of reservoir. We do not control it. It is available in nature. But as the waters of a reservoir are piped with numerous faucets and outlets into millions of homes, so universal energy is tubed or piped or channeled into the lives of living things. Here various faucets regulate its release into usage. These faucets can be controlled, at least in part by the person. And thus he can determine the amount of energy that he uses. But this does not mean that he exhausts any potential cause of energy. The release of energy through his own nature has certain requirements, certain normal purposes. If these purposes are variously blocked, it is as we would find in a home where a difficulty arises in the plumbing and the basement is flooded or something of that nature. It is observable in psychological problems that the control of the amount of energy 
can have a very important bearing upon the problem itself. Now, one thing, of course, that we always have to bear in mind is that if we turn off a house meter, we turn off all of the available outlets. If we throw a switch or blow a main fuse in an electric circuit, then all the lights on that circuit are killed. And our thinking in energy has been that the individual who begins to control his energy begins to reveal lack of energization in all of his activities. In other words, he becomes lackadaisical. He loses ambition. He becomes too sedentary in his ways, too phlegmatic, and is left behind in this great race of life. One of these days we may be le learn that the fellow that is left behind is the one who first enjoys a little peace and quiet, but we are not quite uh, to that way of thinking as yet. But the accusation that is most often turned against mysticism is that it leads to a life of non-action. It causes the person to cease to be a valiant champion of some cause or other, real or imaginary, with which most persons keep their lives occupied. Uh, this is where the control, however, is without direction. If you want to turn off a faucet in the kitchen, you do not need to turn off the water at the curb or ask to have the city turn it off at the dam. <laughs> it is perfectly possible for the individual to direct or control specialized uses of energy as these usages arise within his own understanding and need. Zen, coming into the life of Western man, and it is moving rapidly in the life of Western man today, is simply a, an oriental adaptation of the thought or the basic theme that what we think is important is only important because we think it is important. Therefore, uh, more or less empirically, the amount of energy used by us in any particular undertaking is determined by our own attitude as to the relative importance of that undertaking. Two individuals both suffer a grievance, or perhaps have mutually antagonized each other. To one of these persons, this antagonism becomes the basis of an enduring disregard. Hatred sets in. The most violent, negative, critical, condemnatory emotions are given expression. The other person, who is a party to the same grievance and perhaps has contributed to it or suffers from it, simply does not have this attitude. To him, a person taking a small matter so seriously is humorous rather than desperate. So he simply laughs off a situation that is going to cause another human being years of misery. The difference is the amount of libido that these two persons are willing to expend on something. Now, we cannot deny the fact that persons are born with two essentially diverse dispositions. One individual finds it completely simple to remain detached from the primary pressures of life. The other individual finds it almost impossible to extricate himself. His every instinct is so intense and so extremely personal that he cannot resist any challenge which can possibly stir him up and cause him to become involved in the situation. Where the sense of humor is deficient, this difficulty intensifies. But if you look around you, you will find individuals of comparatively equal intelligence, of approximately similar inherent talents and capacities, who react 
entirely differently to approximately the same stimuli. To one individual, the instinct is to fight back. To the other individual, the instinct is not to fight back. Now we look at the individual who does not fight back and we say, is he a coward? Is he afraid to fight back? Or we say, is he so stupid that he doesn't know he's been insulted? <laughs> That's quite possible. And we begin to analyze his potential deficiencies because we assume that if he was a nice, normal, happy person, he would get mad. If he does not follow this expectancy, we consider the serious possibilities that there's something wrong with him. On the opposite side of the picture, the individual who fights back, why does he fight back? He fights back perhaps he has been in, because he has been insulted. And a person insulted, as one of the old Greek philosophers uh, explains, is in a very precarious position. It only is an indication that he does not know his own weaknesses. Because the moment a person is wise enough to be insulted, he knows so many of his own shortcomings that no one else's discovery of them would be much of a discovery. A man who is insulted can turn and say, I could tell you many things about me more worthy of insult than the thing you have selected. <laughs> Well, this would be rather devastating. <laughs> and would probably ruin the day for some religious <laughs> I've seen things like this happen. And the belligerent one pauses for a moment and then suddenly stands back and laughs. The, the, the pressure is off of the entire situation because the individual has not permitted it to be pressureful. Pressure of this nature is nearly always illusionary. Pressure is pride. Pressure is offended hypersensitivity. Pressure is the determination of arrogance to force a situation, whether it is right or wrong. Pressure in almost every instance arises from the direct abuse of our energy resources. Instead of using our energies to build with, we are using our energies to fight with, to fight against shadows, uh, to create within ourselves patterns of tension which continuously energized ultimately become so habit-ridden, so completely possessive of us that we surrender to them utterly and abjectly. Uh, mysticism has always been a quiet way. It has always been the way of non-violence. Yet mysticism in its great exponents has never been weak. This idea that mysticism must be weak and negative simply arises in a civilization that is determined to justify its own lack of self-control. The mysticism of Jesus was not weak. Jesus recommended strongly that if a man is struck upon one cheek, he turn the other also. If the average person of today performs such an action, he would be called a coward. Yet, it is often a greater test of interior integration to remain poised and calm than it is to express violent displeasure by means of which other people think you are defending yourself. Now we have this situation also to bear in mind. We certainly desire, wherever possible, to keep the good esteem of other people. We do not wish to be regarded as eccentric. We do not wish to be labeled as weaklings. We do not wish to lose a certain propriety of status. On the other hand, is it necessary for us, in order to maintain our social position, 
to commit actions that endanger our health and security and perhaps even our lives. It's like the, the problem of the genial host. Years ago, New York, in the days of the open saloons as they used to be when they were really great social centers and you had five cents worth of drink and four dollars worth of free lunch. That type of situation once actually uh, went barely on its way. And I have definitely seen fine top sirloin steaks go for free along with a five cent stein of beer. Well, those days are gone, but the problem we're in is the bartender. Now the bartender certainly does not wish to make a bad impression. At the same time, every one of his customers wants him to drink with them. If he succeeds in doing this, he will not be a bartender very long. So the bartender, notoriously, is a man who does not drink. He seldom if ever drinks with anyone, and that is a known fact, no one asks him. Now when this arises in the problem of living, we can say that the person who is a continuously trying to please those around him by reacting as they expect him to react has only two choices. Either to be the bartender who drinks when everyone wants him to and very shortly develops ulcers. Or to make some kind of a clear statement of his own values in this matter. Either by revealing it or by affirming it to the degree that he will not be expected to make himself sick in order to make himself companionable. So in mysticism, this situation of the person being different, uh, which does irritate, aggravate, and horrify certain individuals, the process of being different in order to be healthy uh, is a decision that thoughtful persons have to make. Mystics in general have been different without being obnoxious. And that is uh, where the line of, of social proprieties come in. But in life, we must either settle down to being like others, and with doing this, take on all of the karmic consequences of the way they act. Or we must be like our own principles recommend that we should be and have strength enough of character to stand up under a certain amount of misunderstanding and even abuse if the occasion arises. For in the universe in which we live it is much better for us to be abused a hundred times than for us to abuse someone else once. Mysticism by reducing the intensities with which we react to situations begins to smooth out living. It smooths out living by not permitting everything that arises to become highly personalized. It withdraws energy from areas in which that energy is not important and is non-productive and applies this energy to other areas which are important and are productive. This brings, of course, a fine point of difference. The individual who, generally speaking, is heavily loaded with psychic pressures, generally does not have any area to which he can transfer his energy. He is sick, he is in trouble, he is in the spot he's in, because his energy has only a circle of negative outlets and that these outlets are continually punishing him. To tell this person that he should direct his energy into other outlets might present a problem. He has no other. I know a person who had a bad neurotic situation for many years, they were not very healthy physically, had to live a rather sedentary life. I tried for months to try to get this individual to take a little interest in reading. Here he was a warrior. He was miserable, <coughs> critical, thinking of himself all the time, loaded with hypochondria. And he finally admitted to me that never in his lifetime had he read a book and never in his lifetime did he intend to. <laughs> 
he didn't enjoy reading books. I asked him why, and the man was absolutely honest. He said, they take my mind off my misery, and I want to be done. <laughs> well, at least he was franker about it than most. He enjoyed misery more than he enjoyed getting over it. Because he liked to be sorry for himself. This sounds ridiculous. But without the verbal statement of it, it is present in millions of human lives. Innumerable persons, given the opportunity to quietly and symbolically choose between a good constructive interest and self-pity, will cling to self-pity with everything they've got. Because it is such a warming feeling, it, it makes a certain sense of psychic importance is a distinction in being the most miserable person on earth <laughs> or even in the neighborhood. These things cause the person to feel individuality. Actually, there are many better and more important ways of being an individual, and these should also be carefully considered. Zen coming in with other Eastern philosophies and a certain amount of Buddhism and the general trend of the day toward a somewhat more contemplative reaction to the intense pressures of modern life have, uh, then has given us what is now being developed under the term psychology of values. And psychology of value is a very interesting field uh, that shows that we can't help growing in spite of ourselves sometimes. This begins to analyze normalcy in the term of the individual's ability to recognize value. That it's no longer a case of him finding out what is wrong with him. This has been one of the big problems in psychology. The average analytical procedure causes the individual to become hyper aware of himself. The theory, of course, is that if he gets aware of himself long enough and intensely enough and consistently enough, he will in the end get very tired of himself and in that way break away from some of his troubles. But uh, the psychology of value says that it is more important for the person to begin the contemplation of what he should be than the consideration continuously of what he should not be. That the experience of a positive state is highly desirable. The person who is miserable is to a certain degree a person who has never enjoyed being comfortable. If he really had ever enjoyed being happy and had a clear psychic archetypal image of integration, he would find misery an unhappy contrast. But during his entire period of life, he has never sensed by experience a truly positive situation. He was a little miserable as a child. He went through children's ailments and problems. A little more miserable as he got a bit older. His family may have broken up left him falling around among relatives, got into school, wasn't well adjusted, a little more miserable, came out of school, took a job which he didn't like very well, didn't get along with the people around him, married, made a comparatively inadequate marriage, maybe not bad enough to be divorced, not good enough to be worth anything, <laughs> gradually developed two or three children that became a cause of nervous tension, Against these things, no resources within himself, went to church occasionally, thought the minister was an awfully smart man, especially when he talked on current subjects, and just drifted. A little more problem, a little more tension crept in, very soon neurotic situation. The individual gradually sinking further and further into a series of negative experiences. Against these negative experiences, by way of interior contrast, there was no positive experience. 
the individual knew how it felt to be uncomfortable. He did not really know how it could feel to be comfortable. He heard people tell about it. He heard people say that they were blissfully happy. It didn't mean very much, perhaps a little twinge of envy that somebody else was so much more content than he was. But when a person said they were happy, the only way this half-integrated and half-demoralized person could react was by his own definition. And instead of recognizing the other person to be happy, he could only say that the other person was not unhappy. In other words, he could create a contrast only to himself and to his own experience. He could only decide that this other person was different and that certain secret longings or subjective desires that uh, he had intellectualized and emotionally thirsted after did exist. Someone else had them. But he could not even tell what they were actually. It is uh, very much as though each of us tried to plumb the depths of our closest friend or relative's psychic nature. We might have certain intellectual concept of it, but we could not know what it is. Western man, as we know him today, therefore, theoretically, has never experienced normalcy. He has never experienced any normalcy other than that of the traditional degree of unrest peculiar to the time in which he lived. His idea of normalcy is simply an interlude between wars and depressions, socially speaking. Uh, his idea of happiness is the day in which things did not go as badly as they usually do. <laughs> his idea of supreme joy was to be able to get out of a responsibility. He had no real concept of happiness or integration or purpose that was meaningful. Uh, like the two Irishmen working down in the sewer. Uh, one of them looking over the edge of the sewer saw a valuable, expensive automobile go by, evidently carrying uh, some well-financed citizen. So he turned to his friend, he said, if you had money as much as that, Pat, what would you do? Pat said, I'd buy a new pick handle. And that is exactly the problem we're up against. The individual feels that money would help him not to do the things that he does not want to do. But the positive expression of doing something creative, something valuable, something essentially right in itself, the average person in the West has no experience of it. He does not know what it means. He does not know what it means to be quiet in himself. He does no, not know what it means to be truly at peace with life. There are exceptions, of course, but the majority of human beings functioning from a continuous existence of tension are able to measure only tension and the diminution of tension. Tension becomes a normal condition. And if the tension begins to let go, the individual senses relaxation setting in upon himself, he thinks of it as sickness or exhaustion. He simply does not have any way to visualize or to release within himself the archetype of essential normalcy. Well, we, we can intellectualize this and say, well, what is normal? in a time when the whole world is confused, what is to be regarded as normalcy? A very simple answer is given to us by nature in this. For man, normalcy is a way of life that produces health. And normalcy is a way of life that makes men well or keeps men well. The way of life in which the person is not afflicted by the negative consequences of his own action. 
the only way that the Western man can think of that is, well, perhaps if he stays asleep all the time and does nothing, he will thereby not cause himself any, any trouble. To stop doing everything because anything we do is wrong is very much like the pouting child. But again, that might be the individual's attempt. He might say the only way is to run away from the world, to enter into a cloister, or live a monastic life, and escape from all of it. The true answer, the answer of a positive adjustment with life and energy, is just so strange to Western man that he has never hardly investigated it. And this is true of psychology. Psychology is trying to put man back again into health by the same brute force and awkwardness that made the man sick in the first place. It is simply a power drive with one policy driving for dominion over another. The uh, physician pushing in one direction and the patient pushing in the opposite direction. But the physician having certain particular instruments of persuasion that are uh, perhaps stronger or more psychologically impressive has a certain degree of success. He can influence the other person uh, against that person's native instincts to a degree at least. Now why does mysticism play an important part in this? It is because through a consciousness the interior consciousness within ourselves, man is capable of a larger area of experience uh, than his um, immediate intellection might cause him to believe he possesses. Imagination, uh, the more subtle aspects of human energy directive, causes it to be possible for a person to experience certain states by the natural positive determination to do so. It is therefore conceivable to the mystic that a state of peace can be experienced by the individual as a direct state within his own nature. And that it is only through mysticism and mysticism alone that a positive state of what might be called a possible good can be directly experienced by the individual. It is by mysticism that he becomes aware of levels of value in himself which become compensatory to the levels of non-value which afflict him on the outside. If this be true, then psychotherapy has to include a certain going inward into the individual's own consciousness by the individual himself, searching in himself for positive roots of expression and usage. He has to search for the missing values and experience them first within himself, and by so experiencing them, gain a means of positive action. If we take the case of Plotinus, the Neoplatonist, we are told that according to his own record, on only a few occasions, two or three occasions during his, li his lifetime, was he accorded the blessed privilege of a mystical experience. In those brief moments, however, Plotinus, being peculiarly blessed among men, actually experienced the state of human integration. He experienced man as himself fulfilling the human purpose. He became aware of his positive ability to tune into a dynamic reality, to become part of and aware of a dynamic good, whereas it had always previously been that he lived in a dynamic evil and a static good. 
Evil had a power over him. Good did not. Because evil was active in his nature and his, in, his, in his environment. But good was merely a word, a dim fantasy of value, something that had never been truly vitalized. But through the mystical experience, this vitalization took place. And Plotinus experienced the absolute victory of good over the shadow or absence of itself. He became in those instants dynamically good. And by that means dynamically happy. Dynamically in a state of fulfillment. Dynamically adjusted and in complete possession of those ordinal virtues with which man's traditional moral life is said to be associated. Such an experience lasted five seconds, perhaps less. But it was an experience, not an indoctrination. Plotinus could never have been vitalized had someone explained this to him for 50 years. But because it happened to him, because it occurred within his own life, it became an absolute authority in his life. And he told his disciples that all through the years in which no such privileges were again granted to him, he still lived in the serene, living recollection of that which had occurred. The door did not open again for many, many years, but he knew what was on the other side of the door. He had been through the door. Nothing, no one, could alter this conviction, which he could also re-stimulate in memory. In conscious understanding, in recollection, he could relive it a million times because it had happened to him. Mysticism then has this peculiar and wonderful authority of an experience that happens to us and becomes the first important experience against the mediocre. Psychology, realizing the possibility of such a thought, begins to analyze how the mystical experience can be engendered, how it can be conjured out of this mysterious complex of living. There's no use writing it as a prescription because no one can fill it. Yet it is the only remedy, the sovereign remedy, for the innumerable psychological ills of the individual. Actually, of course, the psychotic, the pressure-laden person, is in a very poor situation uh, to have such an experience. Yet this is not totally the fact of the matter. It seems to be. Rationally and even morally, we would assume that the person who is most dynamically wrong is the furthest from the state of being right. And the story of mysticism, however, does not sustain that. As we realize uh, from the theophany of Paul on the road to Damascus, here the mystical experience is given to the apostle at the very time he is on the way to persecute the Christians. He has already stoned them. He already struck and seriously injured James the disciple. He had no interest and no faith, whatever. Yet to him was given this experience. This seems to point out that the mystical experience is no respecter of the ordinary conventions of life. It, is an, it originates in something else. Now, several answers have been given to the Pauline illumination. 
the distances of time and the inadequacies of records make it very difficult to answer this. Some say that Paul at this time was afflicted with stroke, that something definitely happened in his health which reduced him, which broke him interiorly. Another occasion, another group say that he was stricken with blindness. Some say that he was blinded by the vision. Others affirm that this was not the occasion of the blindness, but was associated with it. If Paul had passed through some immediately preceding disaster, this might very easily explain the matter as a break in the armament of his negative aggressiveness. Other mystics, however, are evidence and, and clear proof that the mystical experience is not necessarily simply the result of the perfection of the disposition. What it appears to arise from is the reduction of the energy in the negative pattern of the personality. As we suggested at the very beginning of the talk, instead of exhausting the complex, there are ways and circumstances by which it is devitalized, in which the energy being withdrawn from it reduces its activity. It remains what it has always been, merely a small weed in the garden. If we take energy away from it, it will not grow. If it has already grown and we take energy away from it, it will die. We have spent all our time fighting with the weed. We have never realized that it lived by an energy which we can turn on and off, and that it is the turning off of the energy, and not the fighting with the result of the energy, that gives us our easiest and most lasting victory. Mysticism cultivates within the person who believes it certain religious virtues. Mysticism is founded in the simple doctrines of both Eastern and Western saints whose lives have been very largely dedicated to a quiet, patient, reflective acceptance of the challenge of living and the continuous and unceasing refusal to become violently involved in problems which are of themselves of no importance, of no meaning, of no essential value, and which rise only to satisfy pride or egotism or a moment's emotional instability. So that your mystic actually is a person who gradually takes the energy away from the whole complex of his own psychic personality. He withdraws his support, mental and emotional and vital, from negative patterns. And these patterns, without his support, without his willful direction, without his bestowing upon them uh, the power of the will, willing them into activity and sustaining them by will energy. If he does not do this, these patterns cease or die back again to such controllable dimensions that they are no longer serious problems in life. The mystic by his retirement from confusion, by his relaxation away from tension, thereby acquires two situations that are helpful. First, his natural reduction of intensities automatically helps to clarify the psychic field. And the same reduction in tension helps to clarify his relationship with his own basic consciousness. By moderation in his conduct, he thereby reduces 
any abnormal psychic situation that exists and at the same time makes available to him and to himself his interior hyper-psychic resources, resources that go beyond uh, even his mental, emotional, or psychic propensities. His end always is the same, namely that he shall experience that which is right, and from this gain the absolute criterion of what he should and must be. Because until he experiences the substance of good within himself, he does not know how he can be good. The question always arises, what must a man do in order to be saved? And until man experiences this as solution in his own consciousness, he can only listen to the advice of others. And this listening to advice is not the same thing. We can listen to advice forever and reject it all. But once we have known something, we have a new level of value, a new standard upon which to erect our own structure of life. Zen and other Eastern systems therefore boldly advance uh, what almost might be regarded as a sharp knife, a powerful and directive influence. Instead of wandering around in this misery world of continuous compromises, Zen takes the attitude that this is so, this is not so. The decision is simple. The need for this decision is obvious. The excuses against the decision are numerous and none of them is valid. The person's own predicament is such that the need for solution is desperately indicated. Therefore, instead of locking ourselves in a vast, involved dispute about this matter, let us visualize the situation as the deathbed scene in which the doctors are arguing as to the medication and during the argument the patient dies. <laughs> and that is more or less the situation. While we are making these tremendous uh, philosophical arguments about this and that, our own situation grows steadily worse. And in the midst of all of the defenses that we intellectually conjure to our support, the individual is the living picture of the fact that his position cannot be defended. He proves by his own existence that he is wrong, and then claims by his intellection that he is right. If he continues to do this, of course, he will continue in the difficulties with which he has been plagued from the beginning. Now, in the West, which is not a contemplative world, the, the search for a Western mysticism, a mysticism not different substantially, for there can be really no East or West in truth, but Western in the sense of being presented in a manner as compatible to our experience as possible and at the same time not to compromise its basic integrity. This idea of a Western mysticism is growing in importance to Western man today. He cannot be actually the kind of person that he reads about in the stories of ancient Eastern saints and things of that nature. He just isn't that person. But he has the same need as that person. He has a certain basic respect and veneration for the thing that he does need. But he has to find some way of acquiring what he needs, of making it available to him as a personal experience. 
So psychotherapy approaches this situation. What can we do other than what we are doing in order to help to cleanse this stable of the human psyche and act in the true part of our own Hercules? Obviously, for Western man, this must be brought under some kind of control mechanism. And in that, it's not so different from Eastern man. Certainly, the processes of Eastern meditation are no less scientific than the pro processes of Western psychoanalysis. Nor are their theories, in either case, superficial. And uh, in both instances, there is a thoroughly integrated formula. It is being done in an almost completely scientific way, although it transcends science as we are likely to think of the term scientific. Meditation is also a person starting from a situation and moving from that situation towards a goal or an end which justifies the consecration of life to that end. In some Eastern nations where meditation has been universally practiced, it is seemingly a thoroughly natural, reasonable, and proper force and brings no thought uh, of ridicule or uh, criticism in the public mind. In fact, the person may be regarded with a special esteem because he takes such a life, even as here he is going to be regarded with the most profound suspicion. Yet the end to be attained is, in both instances, approximately the same. But man in the West is thinking of his end in different symbolism. Eastern man thinks of his end, perhaps, as complete emancipation from worldliness. He thinks of the end of his existence is his return to a state of total union with deity. The Eastern mystic has a highly spiritual end which he seeks to attain. To him this end is the only reason for life, and its the existence is a searching for God and good. And the life of godliness and of goodness, these are the proper lives, and the important lives, and other lives are comparatively uh, unimportant. In the West, the goal of man is not good in the sense of God, but good in the sense of adjustment with a situation in which he exists. Western man is not seeking uh, to go to a heavenly place. What he probably is trying to do, if he ever was able to define it clearly, is to bring that heaven here. He wishes to bring heaven here. He wishes to perfect the world he is in, whereas certain mystics have always had the attitude that the sooner out of here, the better. Western man wants to make this world a world of security and peace, and he envisions his daily contribution to the future of his race as a contribution towards some golden age ahead some utopian world to come in which all the five-year plans and the ten-year plans and the longer-range thousand-year plans and the long range from the primitive to now ten-thousand-year plan will sometime result in these plans coming true and that a generation will come into the world sometime in which there will be no sin and death, and that everything will be as beautiful and wonderful as we might want it to be. ...standard of satisfaction. It would be very difficult, therefore, to assume that this world can be rapidly transformed in its totality, picked up as a globe, so to say, and carried from one level of integrity to another. Western mysticism meets this possible 
conflict of concepts with the other situation then that man's own life becomes to a measure a psychosomatic symbol of the whole world. The world as we know it here is made up of an infinite number of beings capable of the statement of I. These beings exist as individuals. But each of these individuals is in a world and is the victim of a world arising within himself and flowing outward into his environment or moving from his environment in upon himself. Thus each person becomes symbolical of the transference of heaven to earth, the bringing of a spiritual state into objectivity within the consciousness of man, the possibility of creating within man the utopian, the individual who possesses the virtues which he desires to have the community virtues of his world. That it is conceivable that the individual can attain this has not been denied. And the resulting thought, of course, that brings some optimism but uh, restraint, is that enough persons gradually coming to this individual discovery could go a long way towards ultimately moving the collective in that direction because by degrees individuals becoming as they are the units of masses. If enough individuals move in a direction, the mass moves in that direction. So mysticism for Western man has to be solutional of something. It is not his departure from life into some mysterious nirvana. It is rather the departure of his ailments, the departure of his difficulties, and the final integration and organization of himself as a directive leader of his own fate with both the wisdom and the strength to be a good leader, uh, to be capable of preserving the peace in his own nature and living according to it. Mysticism for this man cannot be totally disassociated from his immediate needs. And I think it will come into our Western world through the recognition of a process of therapy in which the individual, by the cultivation of certain laws, principles, and practices of mystical procedure, we'll discover that these put his personal life in order and that by putting his personal life in order they accomplish most of the byproducts which he desires. His confusion in all its manifestation represents byproduct. The fact that he is in his present sorry state, sorry state results from this lack of organization. It is itself a byproduct. So if we wish to say that man's sickness, physical sickness, is to a measure psychosomatic, that many of the ailments which are increasing at the present time are directly traceable to tension, or to one or other of the excesses by which the individual has it's his life. If we also want to assume that domestic problems, juvenile problems, vocational maladjustments, all these things to a measure result in man energizing the wrong values, then it means that by the re-education of his basic value sense, much can be accomplished. To re-educate the value sense of man, we may need and will probably ultimately develop a series of disciplines based upon Eastern techniques, but probably a little like some of the adaptations of Eastern art and architecture to our Western way of life, uh, coming upon us almost unawares. Perhaps the architectural situation will be of some use to us at the moment 
in trying to make a point here. We have several great systems of foreign architecture, particularly Oriental, that have been neglected for a long time because for years, for centuries, our public buildings were Greek or Roman, our cathedrals were mostly Gothic, uh, our monuments largely Gothic or Baroque, or if we were extremely luxurious and wanted to finally indicate beyond all doubt that we had wealth and culture, we ran into that glorious, spindly, gold-leaf situation that dignified the Louis of France from the 16th to the 18th, and immediately following the 18th, the deluge. This, uh, uh, probably, this situation caused us a lot of discontent. Now, we have many schools of Eastern architecture, and it is interesting that in selecting by our own subconscious or by the subconscious of our art directors or interior decorators, however they don't get very far unless the client pays them, so it all goes back again to what is acceptable or what the individual is willing to live with. Out of all the systems that could have been drawn upon, the simplest was selected, and that was the Japanese. And it is distinguished by under-furnishing, under-ornamentation, and such problems as bringing outdoors indoors, some magnificent garden composed of nothing but five rocks and comb sand, a, a delightful and glorious uh, house in which, theoretically, if not actually, and ultimately, perhaps actually, you do not even have to continue to live in rooms of the same sizes and shapes. You get tired of your living room, you pull three or four silk petitions one way or the other, and your living room becomes anything you want it to be. You can take all the petitions of the house down if you want to, and change a nine-room house into one room. Or you can, if you're a little tired of that, you can put up so many petitions that it will make a house that resembles a cell block at Sing Sing. You can have what you want. You live in walls that are only where you want them to be. And that's Zen. The ability to change the shape of your room to meet the shape of your life. You can also realize that your consciousness following into all of these shapes can be any and all of them. Your consciousness can be a one-room house consciousness or a nine-room house consciousness. You can have a consciousness that wishes to be alive with the sky or the air and wants no walls. And you have complete control over whether you want walls or not. It is not necessary for you to blast through 16 feet of solid concrete as in the time of Richard the Lionhearted in order to get into a house. In those days they built walls to keep people out. And what did they do? They kept the people on the inside in. And every barrier we build to protect ourselves imprisons ourselves. So suddenly we like to see rivers flowing into our living room. We like to see doors and windows where walls used to be. And we like walls that we can argue with a little bit, pushing them this way, getting rid of them that way, if we don't like them. We are tired of the bric-a-bracs and of the oddments and all this type of thing. And our, and our taste today moves toward this openness, this broad sweep this lack of boundaries. It tells us something. It is all part of a kind of an astute full of formula, a Zen formula. And when we are thinking of art today, we go into the Zen type of generic art. We go into an art uh, that goes back to the basic value of simple line and the tremendous importance of the full consciousness of line and color. These things point out psychological changes, and they also point out 
the desire of the person not to be cluttered. This against clutteredness is showing up all through our culture. It is showing up everywhere where man has been for ages cluttered. His house is nothing more or less than his escape from himself. He is doing with his house what he wants to do with himself. And his relation to his house to himself is the relation of his psyche to his being. And today he is very anxious to get rid of a cluttered up psyche. And he has learned that one way that he can get rid of it is simply to make his walls of paper and silk instead of iron and steel. That he also can get rid of it by getting rid of debris, of cutterage. And uh, psychology may so slowly realize, as it has, that a badly demoralized psyche is very much like a room over furnished. Back in the old days when nothing was ever thrown away, uh, in the days when the portiers were threaded eucalyptus buds alternating with leaves, when small window curtains were beautifully festooned out of father's cigar bands, in those days nothing was ever lost. The drapes were hung with little pinned reproductions of children's drawings that had been there. The wedding wreaths were underneath glass bells. Everything was velour and velvet and felt. Every uh, tabletop resembled uh, a present piece of kitchenware. It was heavily loaded with marble and mosaic or something that was the 19th century equivalent of linoleum. <laughs> linoleum was liable to appear in the living room just as well as anywhere else. For portraits of those long dead, most of them apparently having died of various types of grievances from the expressions, <laughs> were everywhere. This was the stuffy old psyche. This was the individual living in an atmosphere in which there was no freedom for his own soul. He lived overshadowed by the grimness of hereditary bestowals. And the psychologist today trying to explain to the individual that he is suffering from a broken home and the individual going back and visualizing that early childhood difficulty is in very similar condition to the same man going to the family homestead, going into this room and seeing these grim-faced relatives glowering down upon him uh, from across the years. Relatives that still live in him as part of his psychic content. Uh, situations that mean that he has inherited this whole stuffy mess and that he has carried it on through the years. Now it's wonderful for someone to try to put these things in order, but you cannot put a good many of them in order. There's only one thing to do with them, throw them away. They are of no importance to anyone. These cherished things that 50 years ago would have been lovingly preserved at the cost of life, if the house was on fire, the individual would gladly have been burned to death rescuing them. These things are now worthless. We cannot say in psychoanalysis, learn to get used to them. What's the use? We cannot say, well, don't forget that this hatchet-faced ant up on the wall <laughs> was really the victim of a bad psychotic time herself. Look how her parents treated her and how their parents treated them. So gradually learn to see the good in your miserable old man. <laughs> learn to see that underneath she is only the symbol of your own frustration. What's the use? Just take the picture and turn it to the wall. Or better still, throw it away. Now you can go through this same room and you can try to reconcile yourself. 
you can say yes these gorgeous portieres of eucalyptus buds were wonderful at the time they were made they were the production of loving spinster sisters who had nothing much more important to do because they couldn't play the piano all the time <laughs> these things have sentiment to them they are nostalgic they, are, they have a sacredness about them uh, they, they made somebody very happy or at least help, help somebody to be unhappy in a pleasant manner <laughs> this situation causes them to, to be part of us to be part of our background well, we can, we can do that. We can take them down and we can carefully roll them up and say sometimes somebody may want them, although we know they never will. Or we may try to live with them. We may try to, uh, get, uh, to, keep, to clear our dream life so that we can wander through this house and this room whistling with sheer joy because we understand everything in it so well. It's all reconciled now. But what have we done? We've reconciled ourselves with something that wasn't anything in the first place. That had certain, perhaps, excuses for existence, but never any reasons. It belonged to a way of life that was dated like a geological strata. Once it's gone, with it went the dinosaur and the megatherium. There's no, there no further relationship in these heads. Now, if our own haunted house, our own psychic nature, carries this tremendous burden, there is no real gain from trying to rationalize it, from trying to accept it, from trying to say, I'll live with it, regardless. Well, maybe we could live with it, but it means nothing. It is only punishing ourselves for no purpose. It would be very much better to take a perfectly simple Zen attitude in this, because a Zen monk coming in, looking around very carefully, would probably burn the place. In other words, it, it would be the simplest answer. There would be, there would be, there's no need, there's nothing to be gained from it. It has no answers for questions or problems that we need, or that we need. Consequently, if the whole situation dies out in us, completely and totally, it is far better. There is also no reason why we should go around in the presence of this uh, saying, I don't like it. But because I don't like it, I must now accuse myself of being disloyal to it. It's not any good. I know it isn't any good. But I have loyalties. I am in some way required by a code to protect this thing and, if possible, transform it into a national monument. <laughs> it must go on. Now, many people kill themselves with that type of loyalty. And nothing gained again. So mysticism, cutting through all of this, gives us the concept of the simple house. The house in which the walls are very simple. In which things that are no longer valuable are buried honorably where their ghosts will no longer walk where these situations can no longer arise and the individual lives in the free air looking out through these cloistered and sorry walls back to the sky and the earth which were his common parents here lies man's return to value and escaping the stumbling block of trying to get there by passing through a mystic maze of everybody else's values which he can never do anything about anyway he does not need to say his ancestors were wrong any more than he hopes his descendants will say that he is wrong but these things do not add anything and while we are fighting with these struggling with them trying to root them out one by one the years go by, the sickness goes on, and the person who is cured of one ailment simply turns his face to another corner of the same room and is just as sick again. It is, it is the same problem, infinitely repeating itself. Today, physically, we would scarcely do this anymore. 
It's on rare occasions now that persons literally hold on to things this way. The outer symbolism is broken by the five senses that can't tolerate it. But the interior symbolism is held together by subjective pressures and by a certain psychic loyalty. And perhaps this peculiar tie back to the past, which is part of the psychological entity of all of us, and which unfortunately is not always tied to the right part of the past. There is a value in that tie, but only when it is properly and adequately used. The psychic uh, mystic problem goes into this gradual fading away of false value. They're getting away from this miserable conglomerate into simplicity again. And the house of today is a little bit symbolic of that. Some of these modern houses are pretty bad. But the principle of getting away seems to be driving the individual, driving him to more or less stylized expressions of living, in which he is less and less a slave to literal particulars, but prefers, rather, to live in an atmosphere of broad, almost metaphysical implications is depending less and less upon the completeness of design. He is expecting that completeness to be supplied rather than provided. He expects the individual who beholds it to sense something more than he sees. And he leaves the situation in this way, rather open and fluid, which is much better for his psyche. If we would take this architectural release that he has uh, gained and try to apply it uh, to his interior psychic life, we would begin to understand perhaps something of mystical content. The rebellion on the outside is almost a mandala. The rebellion on the outside gives him a tremendous symbolic instrument to work with. And here we come to, uh, I think, a very powerful factor in this entire situation. Man finds it comparatively easy to follow lines that are familiar to it. As he becomes adjusted to one level of a value, he becomes adapted to other less obvious value levels that are similar. Thus the person living in the open house uh, with its very simple, austere, human factors, depending more and more upon nature moving in upon it. This individual is constantly contemplating a value. Perhaps he didn't originally build a house that way. Perhaps an architect built it, or a decorator provided the furnishings. Perhaps it was only a stylization when he moved in. But if it was well done, this stylization begins to move in him. And the mandala is always the thing on the outside that starts something working on the inside. It is something that by looking at, or by studying, or by contemplating, we create a series of reminiscent revelations. Something moves in upon us, something moves out to meet it. And the thing that moves out to meet it is usually our need, moving out to meet a supply of some kind. Or it is a quality within ourselves, moving out to a different quantity of that quality in the thing outside of us. The mandala in Oriental art is consequently usually a highly symmetrical and highly symbolical structure. It is a design that is lawful in its formation and is peculiarly and specially intended to portray a principle and to portray it in a way that is acceptable to us inasmuch as the portrayal is accomplished by archetypal symbols. By archetypal symbols we mean symbols which in the subconscious of all persons must be essentially interpreted in the same way as against the common symbol which is capable of any kind of interpretation. Archetypal symbols usually, therefore, go back to the great motions of humanity, to the great religions, the great structures, by means of which a certain device or figure brings to the conscious attention of the individual certain factors, certain thoughts, certain restorations of memory, 
which he will share with millions of others who look upon the same device because the symbols themselves are archetypal and are so intended to be. If therefore the individual creates an archetypal order in his life, he is constantly releasing this archetype. And in the releasing of it, he finds positive experience as against negative experience. Now it probably is too soon to say that the American house builder is actually fulfilling or obeying the essential principles of all these archetypes. He is not. The Eastern master would not permit one column window or door in that building to be placed without absolute consideration for law. The Western master will not do that. He is merely concerned with a general effect. But the general effect is improving to a degree. Therefore, it is telling us something of man's recognition of archetypal symbol factors in his own life. It is telling us, for example, that man wants to allow nature to move in upon him more. He wants to live in a larger world. He wants to also live in a world in which he draws from basic resources. He wants to live in an uncluttered world. And he wants to live in a world that reminds him of universals rather than particulars. He wants to reduce, therefore, the furnishing of this house to its utilities and to such elements of essential decoration as have the greatest basic significance for him. Thus he, was, he appoints into his house no longer a mass of confused things, but a reduction in which his emphasis is upon luxury as the right of beauty rather than the right of clutteredness. It used to be that if you were very, very luxurious, you loaded everything. A luxurious individual had nine times as many chairs as he needed. The luxurious individual had much larger pom-poms on the end of his curtain uh, <laughs> cords. He also had magnificent uh, diapered uh, plush edging on the curtains so that every time you moved the curtain it was as though you were moving the entire structure of history. <laughs> and of course it was just as dusty usually. <laughs> but there was mass that counted. Tremendous evidence of this. Today we find one good painting, one fine piece of sculpturing. Perhaps neither the painting nor the sculpturing too good in substance, but simplification, definite reduction, it may be the selection of the art is not real, does not represent personal taste, maybe only general convention, but it is reduced to a recognition that a few things become important in themselves. Many things lose all importance. We go into the life of the person with the same thing. Our great psychological problem today is this clutteredness, which is resulting in desperation, emergency feeling within ourselves. We feel like the young wife coming into one of these ancestral mansers and feeling a, a almost irresistible des a desire to throw it all out. She is overwhelmed by factors that were never her own, that ne meant nothing to her, and close in upon her like ancient relatives. She wants to rebel against them. She wants to furnish the place over again to furnish it according to the living desires of her own nature. The same thing has to happen in the person. Coming into our own subconscious, which is a conglomerate of many things, including pressures, traditions, our own bad habits, and everything you can think of, the individual either has to put this thing in order, or else he has to live in a continual state of internal irritation. Now, perhaps the psychologist in this place becomes the interior decorator. He has to try to rearrange these elements of design. But he assumes that they all have to stay there. He assumes also that if he rearranges these things, that he can arrange them until they are better for the patient because of formulas that he possesses. 
and that he is the one who must decide what is normal and what is abnormal. That it is necessary for the patient to fulfill a series of rules to achieve certain particular victories over certain things and that the final victory to be attained is the ability to live with the ravage. That the individual must be able to live in the haunted house and laugh at the ghost. That seems to be uh, the real end that we're, that we're working for. That he must be able to get along with the inconsistencies in himself. That he must live in this house unfurnished by taste but filled with accumulated furniture and fixtures. The East will not permit this attitude in its basic thinking. It is not that the psychological adjustment is so that the person can live with himself. This is only a, an excuse and, be, and actually doesn't work. The individual who has reached the point where he can live with himself doesn't want it. He still finds himself totally boring, uninteresting, and unpredictable and inexplicable as far as its own nature is concerned. When you learn to live with the psyche, you are only learning to live with the mystery because of the fact that even psychology cannot tell you what it is. This is not the end that is sought. Rather, the end is to, to clear away uh, the entire structure through, we'll say, the development of a recognition of universal taste. When the person has good taste, he is capable of cleaning his own house. As long as a, doctor, a decorator does the job, we are never sure that the person himself is going to be happy. After the decorator has finished the house, the decorator has to a measure pleased himself, but he is not going to live in the house. Perhaps the person for whom he has decorated the house has given him, as far as possible, the ideas. But you'd be surprised how many people get an expensive decorating firm and then have no ideas of their own at all. They just move in into the grandeur that the decorator has conceived. And as one individual told me after living in it for six months, he put his desk and card table out in the garage because he couldn't live in the grandeur. He had a, a decorated home that cost him a quarter of a million dollars. He couldn't live in it. It wasn't his home. He had been raised in a farmhouse. He had happened to get rich. But still, this glory of it all simply pressed in upon him giving him the most terrible mental inferiority complex he felt himself incapable of living on so high a standard of elegance and opulence so the attempt to reorganize these interiors according to a formula the attempt to take the individual's life and straighten it out in terms of Freud or in terms of Adler or in terms of any of these uh, psychologists assumes that they have to be right and also that a broad formula, not too broad actually, is applicable to most people. These, these facts have never been demonstrated in psychoanalysis that certain pressures can be reduced, the individual can be counseled into a better state of living, is undeniably true. But this same individual may go back for counseling six months later with a new problem and the whole thing start over again. The actual achievement of a proven norm has not taken place. And, of course, the counselor is in trouble on this also because as soon as the patient feels well enough to get along without him, he doesn't come back. And most of the time, this even the treatment that is available is never completed. So you don't get too far with it. Mysticism, by getting behind the whole situation, helps the individual to recognize clutteredness and order. It helps him to recognize simplicity and confusion. And if he can recognize those two groups of couplets, 
He is pretty well out of his troubles on almost everything. If he will cling to water and cling to simplicity, he will never be very far from integration and improvement of health and attitude. It is when he departs from these basic things that he then requires every type of psychological help that he can possibly receive. So in the West, I, will, I believe that we are going to begin not to probe the individual continuously to find out what is lurking in the subconscious. We are rather going to realize that if man has been conditioned by environment, and this conditioning moving in upon him has caused the situation that... Uh, we generally recognize as psychotic that we have learned a tremendous fact about man we have learned that something from the outside can move in upon the inside and make a profound effect upon the inside of life now we have allowed this to always be a more or less detrimental thing although nature is constantly reminding us that through this experience pattern from the outside, net nature itself is perfecting our own accomplishment. But what comes in through these sensory perceptions and goes into the inner life of man as a modifying force can be either orderly or disorderly. We get back to the simple problem of Pythagorean philosophy. Namely, that Pythagoras believed that medicine could be taken into the body through the eyes and the ears that that part which is taken in at the mouth has the greatest effect upon the body. That which has, is taken in upon, with the eyes has the greatest amount of effect upon the psyche. And that which is taken in through the ears has the greatest effect upon the mind. That these represent, therefore, senses the eyes, instruction the ears, nutrition the mouth. The medicines can come through all three of these avenues. And in your mystical lore, the eyes have become tremendously important on the psychic or soul level. The ears play a subordinate but also often important role. But the eyes particularly give man the experience of beauty. They give man the power to contemplate the orderliness of life and they can be focused upon the meditation forms, medicine through the geometric arrangements of devices, the mandala, uh, the flower arrangement, the tea ceremony, everything by means of which the individual becomes capable of receiving into his nature the archetypal symbols of contentment, order, relaxation, peace, integration. These things can move in upon him, just as surely as chaos can move in upon him. And through uh, meditation, the individual, through increasing discrimination, makes more and more use of these available faculties and powers. He always with the purpose of receiving into himself certain impressions and then moving these impressions by his own inter interior energies. In this respect, supposing the individual seated quietly in some convenient area in the process of his mystical thinking, looks out across the landscape, sees hills and valleys and the little town, and becomes very much aware of the type of scene that we have with the story of Gray's Elegy. A very pastoral scene. A scene in which the human interference to nature is very slight, and a, a, a wonderful soft glow hangs over life. The simple glow of nature itself. Now this contemplating person, being, we'll say for this moment, a mystic, now returns to the common concerns of the day, or perhaps to the concerns of rest, 
and in his inner life he restores this pattern. He begins to build his concept of interiors upon the placidity of nature which he has seen around him. Thus the pastoral scene moving in upon himself with its attendant emotional tranquillities give him a kind of experience which he can internally estimate. As he therefore becomes more adroit at these things, more advanced in the usages of them, he finds the very definite possibility of reorienting his attitudes toward life. He finds that as he sits quietly, looking out upon the thing as it is, that he realizes the life apart from the desperate desire to change that thing. He knows perfectly well that if a real estate agent was sitting there, the place would be mentally subdivided within five minutes. The man would move in upon it. That a hundred different motives of profit or gain could be contemplated by looking out over that landscape. But if you do not have those motives within your own consciousness, if rather you are accepting this scene as therapy, as a kind of medicine arising from restoring strong, real relationships between yourself and life, you will have a different type of experience and a rich one and an enriching one. Gradually, you will also gain a skill in this. You will gain the possibility to achieve this orientation in ever more confused situations. You will find that someday you can look out of an office window upon a busy street with all its traffic and its noises and its confusion, and still with this interior apperception, you will be able to put this thing in order you will be able to completely transcend its ability to confuse you, yet you will not deny its existence, deny its effects, or minimize it, or ignore it, but it simply will not have the power to disorganize you or cause you to be lost in that confusion. Mysticism can make you a kind of in the world, but not totally of the world. It permits you to do everything that you normally would do or that others would find it proper for you to do, and yet do it in an unworldly way. You can do these things without ever becoming so involved in them that you bestow upon them the right to hurt you. The moment you do something and become involved in it, you are going to be hurt by the one who doesn't appreciate it. Zen would strike at this thing with everything that it has, with a sharp knife, because as long as the other person can hurt us, we will be in pain, even to the end of time. We will blame the other person, and to the end of time, it will be ourselves at fault. It is this case of the wrong placing of the blame will lead to modern Western psychotic situation. It is only mysticism that can prevent the wrong placing of the blame. It is only a degree of consciousness that is strong enough not to place blame that is the only absolute remedy for the situation. The consciousness to whom blame or not blame becomes equally unimportant, inasmuch as all things are done for the sake of themselves. All good is for the sake of good. All truth is spoken for the sake of truth. It is not to please nor to displease to gain nor to cost. It is not to add or to diminish. It is not to satisfy or dissatisfy. As the Oriental mystic points out, the thing is done because of the necessity within the thing itself to be done. It must be fulfilled. 
and being fulfilled in this way nothing is neglected and no one is hurt it is not a case of, of the individual doing certain things regretfully or other things with great gusto and glee it is that the simple problem of the doing of the thing because the doing of that thing is next in mysticism there is this complete detachment uh, from uh, the consequences in terms of other people's reactions the great problem is that the mystic must be moved by a standard of value in which he is constantly mindful of his responsibility to truth for the use of truth he is not censored by others he is censored by the deed he performs he is censored by the word he speaks he is censored by the thought he thinks and not by the judgment of other persons if he can understand this gradually these psychic pressures will diminish in his own nature he will find that the desire to push by exercise of will against inevitable ceases when a thing has to be pushed it is not timely now you will say but many things would never get done if we didn't push them that isn't true if we understand what is meant by mysticism mysticism is not achieved by the weight of the push mysticism is achieved by the inevitable integrity of the purpose it can and must be preserved with a certain simple dignity and experience has shown that the absolute integrity of the purpose is stronger than a push yet there must be one or the other where we're not too easily able to prove our point we push where the value is itself moving the situation it moves itself if we become its servant therefore the, uh, the uh, mystic clearly interiorly visualizes and states and if his integrity and his visualization is true the thing is pushed but not by effort it is moved by its own inevitable need it is moved by the fact that it is trusted to a law and because it is lawful it must win it is where we have to defend that which is not lawful that we have to push so hard with all this pushing comes exhaustion with exhaustion irritation with irritation more pushing and finally we tie ourselves into a hopeless complex so psychology today is beginning to seriously investigate this Zen concept of effortless effort this process by means of which we simply do not fight all of these complexes that we have but substitute for this battle that we have previously fought a very simple and direct positive search for value to search for the thing we have not had the reason for being different from what we are value if recognized becomes worthy of service the individual will remain as he is until value teaches him or informs him or reveals to him that he is not in harmony with that which is valuable so in psychology we are developing this value penetration in which we believe firmly that if the person has a greater appreciation for beauty and understands it better a greater recognition of nature and a simple acceptance of nature a greater uh, variety of natural simple constructive interests 
and a stronger internal meditative life, not meditating for what he wants, but meditating to experience the state he needs, achieving through experience and meditation and diversification the personal awareness of a state of existence better than he is. In other words, that in moments like Plotinus, in these moments he will suddenly experience himself as being better than he is, or better than he knows that he is. There will be moments in which he will be picked up into peace. There will be seconds occur to him in which the confusion will open and he will see the bright light of sky beyond. There will be moments in which he will experience a greater peace than he has ever known. Then the currents will close again and he will be swirled along into another uncertainty. But as he cultivates interiors, he will have these moments. He will have these moments in meditation or in the very simple association with the necessary. And out of these moments, he gradually will integrate his positive philosophy. He will say to himself, whatever that mood is that I had, I don't know what it is, but that mood is value. That mood is the thing which if I could possess it, I would need nothing else. That mood would end all interval of misunderstanding between myself and myself, and also between myself and every other living creature. Therefore, this mood of value must be cultivated. It is not a matter of education. It is not a matter of the overcoming of every other thought that I possess. It is simply the effort to cultivate a few positive values, a positive realization of something. And even the troubled person can search for some value. Value in religion, value in a good book value in a work of art, value in a present walk, pleasant walk in the garden, value in the kindly office of a friend, value in one of a thousand different things. The experience of value is the first and simplest form of illumination. And it is also the thing that becomes the guide of our lives. Because the moment we experience a superior state, we are moved to make that state real to build it into ourselves as a permanent part of our own natures. As time goes on, I hope that we shall be able to do more with this subject because it opens a new concept of many things. But tonight we are past our time, so I guess we have done all that we can for this evening. And remember that next week we begin...